Bienvenidos. Welcome to City Break Seville, Episode 1. Introduction. I've wanted to go to Seville since forever, and I'm really looking forward to doing a series of podcasts on it. I think it has that pull, doesn't it, somehow? The writer Laurie Lee put it very well in his book, As I Walked Out One Midsummer Morning. He describes walking through Spain from the northern port of Vigo and all the places he went to, and he writes about approaching Seville the following. Ever since childhood, I'd imagined myself walking down a white dusty road through groves of orange trees to a city called Seville. Long before he wrote that, there was a Spanish proverb which goes something like, if you've missed out on seeing Seville, then you've really missed something marvellous. So with those thoughts in mind, let's hope I can do the city justice. As ever, in City Breaks, the first introductory episode is designed to give you a little bit of an introduction to the city, geographically, historically, culturally, give an idea of some of the themes that will be coming up in the next episodes, and then finally, a rundown of the remaining 12 episodes to tell you exactly what to expect in each one of them. So, geography then. Seville is the capital of Andalusia, which is Spain's most southerly region, and I think it's fair to say Andalusia is a very particular part of Spain. Got two coasts, Atlantic and Mediterranean, for a start, so open to all sorts of cultures arriving via those two routes. It's got Spain's highest mountain range, the Sierra Nevada, some of which is snow capped all year round. So, already a hint of some of the drama that seems to exist everywhere in that region. The other pertinent fact about Andalusia, perhaps, is the fact that its southern tip is actually only 14 kilometres from the nearest part of the African coast. So again, that accounts for the vast mix of cultures that you find hidden in Andalusia if you go looking. The fact that it's been an entry point over the centuries for waves and waves of people from different places. So, high drama. I think it's also a place that we think of in clichés. If you think about Spain generally, most of what you think of as the Spanish clichés do in fact hail from Andalusia. It is, for example, the region in which we find the Costa del Sol. It's also a region with lots of those little mountain villages with the small white houses, the whitewashed buildings. It's got a range of ancient cities like Seville and Cordoba and Granada, with their mysterious feeling Arabic past. Cities full of cobbled streets and flower-filled patios and tinkling fountains. Yes, you will find all of that in Andalusia. Also, the romance of Spain. It's the place where flamenco and bullfighting first originated. And yet we mustn't forget that throughout history it has also been one of Spain's very poorest regions. Turning again to Laurie Lee, here's his description of crossing that part of Andalusia that was leading him into the city of Seville. Quote, we began to cross the plain that rolls gently towards the Guadalquivir. It was brown as a camel and smelt of fine herbs. There were walled farms here and there, and wooden crosses by the roadside. Herds of black bulls roamed slowly in bronze pastures. A castle stood up sharply from the core of a dead volcano, and above, in the wide sky, two white flamingos flew. So, narrowing down then from Andalusia into the city of Seville, the first thing you have to say about its geographical position is that it really is defined by its position on the river Guadalquivir, it's actually about 50 miles inland, but nevertheless it has been a mighty port in its time. And that's the reason why it's described in Spanish as being Puerto y Puerta. Puerto being a port and Puerta a gateway. So it's a city that's been a port and it's also been the gateway into Spain for so many people. Its role as a port made it a trading city, especially in the boomtown years of Spain's golden age the time when Columbus and all the other explorers were sailing from Seville or nearby cities to discover America or to go off towards the Far East. At that point, actually, Seville had a monopoly on trade with the New World. Queen Isabel saw to that. So at the height of the Golden Age, galleons were arriving in Seville with vast quantities of gold and silver, not to mention unknown foodstuffs like potatoes and tomatoes. And yes, I'm afraid, slaves too. At the same time, people were arriving in Seville from many other parts of Europe, having heard that this was the place where you could make your fortune. Now, all of that from the importance of the river. 
When Richard Ford visited in the 1830s, he said, quote, There are several ways of getting to Seville. First and best, entirely by water, is the steamer up the Guadalquivir. I think most of us probably arrive by EasyJet these days, possibly by train. But I would be inclined to agree that yes, sailing up the river would be the way to go. As to the layout of the city, most of it is on the east bank of the river, and that part can be divided really into four main areas, so I'll just run through them quickly. The one called El Arenal is the old port area. It used to be known actually in its heyday as El Barrio del Mal Vivir, literally the area of bad living, by which I think they meant the low-life area, the dangerous part, the part where, yes, there was a lot of money to be made, but there were probably also a lot of thieves and baddies. To people outside Seville in the 15th and 16th century, El Arenal was the place where they believed the streets were paved with gold, the place to get to if you wanted to make your fortune. Today there is certainly a smart part to El Arenal, the tree-lined promenade along the river with the big buildings on it such as the Bull Ring and the city's main opera house and the art gallery, Museo de Bellas Artes, but behind that, you've still got a jumble of narrow streets, small houses, an area that you can see, although it feels very safe today, may have had a slightly questionable past. Further back from the river, so further to the east of El Arenal, is the area of Santa Cruz, formerly the Jewish area of the city, a labyrinth of tiny little, very picturesque streets, houses set back behind iron grills, you can look through them to the patios beyond, which are often very beautiful, decorated with a mix of plants and little flower tubs, tiles, maybe a fountain, quite secluded, quite secret looking, and much snapped by tourists. En route from the El Arenal area to Santa Cruz, you'll pass what's probably the very best known bit of the city, with the cathedral, the Giralda, which is the bell tower next door, and the Alcazar, the former royal palace. And then beyond that, you'll find the tiny streets which are the Santa Cruz area, full of little shops and restaurants, and the Jewish Museum, a testament to the lives of Jews in the city in centuries gone by, and particularly a place to remember the Spanish Inquisition. If you go north from El Arenal and Santa Cruz, you come to the district which is perhaps of the four, the one you'll least go to, La Macarena. Plenty of reasons to visit it. It's got a number of jewel-like Baroque churches, for example. The best-known one is the Macarena. Actually, that was rebuilt in the last century. But anyway, it's famous because it's the place where the Virgen de la Esperanza Macarena is housed. That being the model of the Virgin, which is in the church all year round, which comes out once a year to be one of the big stars of the Semana Santa, the Holy Week, processions. Also in the Macarena, you'll find one of Seville's newer monuments, something called the Metropole Parasol. If you've seen a picture of it, I'm sure you remember it. Futuristic monument. The locals call it Las Sietas, the mushrooms, because it does look a bit like some giant mushrooms. But you can climb up to the top and get one of the best views of the city from there. And then south of El Arenal and Santa Cruz, the fourth area, the Parque Maria Luisa, the Maria Luisa Park kind of the recreational area of the city, really, centred around this lovely park, with its tree-lined pathways and its tile-covered benches, fountains, statues, horse-drawn carriages. You can wander through there and think you're back at the end of the 19th century. Highlights to be seen there are the very fancy buildings put up for the great festival of Spanish and American culture, planned for 1929. Legacies include two huge museums, one for archaeology and one of Andalusian customs, and then, most photographed of all, the grand and oh-so-Spanish Plaza de España, which is, ooh, how to describe it, a huge, decorative, sweeping crescent, curving round a boating lake, decorative fountains, think pleasure, leisure, wandering about, ice creams, etc. But very beautiful. And then, in addition to those four areas, on the east side of the river, the fifth area is on the other side, a place called Triana, which was very much formerly a working class district, always a little bit elsewhere. It's actually a fact that the first really reliable bridge to get to Triana did not go up until, wait for it, 1845. So it was always the other side 
the place that you could get to on wobbly footbridges or by boat. And so it very much developed a character of its own. It's said to be the birthplace of flamenco. It's also well known for producing bullfighters. I think it was a tough area where maybe the lure of growing up to be a famous bullfighter and get away and make something of your life was just overwhelming. And Triana is also well known because it's the place where most of the tiles, which you will see all over Seville, were produced. So that's the basics of the geographical layout, except perhaps to add that the main artery of the city is a road called Avenida de la Constitución, which stretches all the way from the Puerta de Jerez to the Plaza Nueva, where you will find a statue of King Ferdinand. That was a trading street even in Moorish times. In the Middle Ages, it was a place where you'd find traders, money changers, artisans, the main street of the city. OK then, so much for the geography. What about the history? I think the key fact about Seville is to grasp the idea of how many different cultures and ethnic groups have passed through the city, often staying for generations or indeed centuries, and contributed in their different ways to its culture. In the 1830s, Richard Ford wrote his travel book, a handbook for travellers in Spain, and he quoted in there the inscription which he saw on the Puerta de Jerez, one of the city gates, which read as follows. Hercules built me, Julius Caesar surrounded me with walls and lofty towers, a Gothic king lost me, a saint-like king recovered me. So there you have the history of Seville summed up in a handy four phrases. The city's own guidebook, something called Seville, the Magic City of Spain, spells this out in even more detail, and it lists the various groups who peopled the city, as they put it, since ancient times, and who have left, quote, an indelible imprint on the city. And they would be Tartessians, Phoenicians, Greeks, Carthaginians, Romans, Visigoths, Arabs, Jews and Christians. OK, so again, a handy reminder. Obviously, we don't want to get lost in the detail, but I'm going to go through the main periods of history which are particularly important for Seville and just try and point out things that you can see in the city today which are reminiscent of those eras. So, starting perhaps with the Romans, because they're the first people who've left anything very much. There's not much left of the Phoenicians or the Greeks. And actually, even of the Romans, not a great deal that you can actually see in the city. Although, if you go to the Almeida de Hercules, the boulevard running along the river, you will see some Roman columns there, and two of them with statues on top, actual Roman statues, one of Hercules, said to be the founder of the city, and one of Julius Caesar. You can see much more about the Romans if you go to the Musee Archeologico, the archaeology museum, where they have literally thousands of exhibits. Better again, if you have the time, would be to go out to the nearby ruined city of Italica, where there are extensive remains of the Roman city that was there, which was the birthplace of two Roman emperors, Trajan and Hadrian, and where you can wander around the ruined remains of streets, villas, an amphitheatre, and really get a picture of how important the Romans were in this area. You're going to miss out the next wave of people who came, the Visigoths, and move straight on to the Moors, who really have left a mark in the city, probably more than any other ethnic group, I would say. So they arrived in the 8th century, in 711 to be precise. They arrived in Gibraltar, and pretty quickly colonised most of southern Spain, and were there, not always in charge, but there, in great numbers, really, for seven or eight centuries. Best example of Moorish architecture left in Seville is the Giralda, the bell tower next door to the cathedral. Where the cathedral stands today, there was a mosque. That's been completely destroyed, the cathedral was built on top of its remains. But the tower next door, which formed the minaret of the mosque, was kept and turned, in fact, into the bell tower for the cathedral. A really good example of the mix of cultures, one building on another. And also something, when you think that it stood for 800 years plus, that stands as a testament to the architectural skills of the Moors who lived in the city. It's stable, it's beautiful, and it's lasted for centuries. A less immediately obvious example of Moorish architecture in Seville is the Torre de Oro, the gold tower which is down on the river and dates from about 1220. Originally, when it was built, there were two of them, one on each side of the river, so that a heavy chain could be stretched between the two, 
and then the people of Seville could stop unwanted ships from sailing into their city. When Théophile Gautier visited in the 19th century, he immediately saw that this was Moorish architecture and described the, quote, jagged, saw-like Arab battlements. And then thirdly, there are the main walls of the Alcazar, which date from this period, as does the beginning of the palace inside, although that's quite a complicated story, as you'll discover in the episode on that building. Christians took Seville back in 1248, although the two or three hundred years after that marked a period when many of the Moors stayed on in the city. And when we can say that the newly arrived Christians were very impressed with what they found when they arrived. King Ferdinand's chronicler, for example, wrote, quote, No place so wealthy or so beautiful has ever been seen before, nor any so populous or powerful or so filled with noble and marvellous sights. And this period after their arrival is known as the Mudéjar period, Mudéjar being the Moors who elected to stay on in Seville and other parts of southern Spain, even though they were no longer ruling it. And it's a period when the architecture which was built was often a mix of both cultures, because, as we've just heard from King Ferdinand, the Moorish aptitude for architecture and design was very much appreciated. So in a building like the Palacio Pedro, Peter the Cruel's palace, inside the Alcazar, You'll still see the many features like arches, domes, delicate plasterwork and tile decorations with geometric patterns. 1492, that's not just the year when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, it is also the year when the city of Granada fell, meaning that the Christians had actually taken back the whole of Spain. We know that Ferdinand and Isabella, the new reigning monarchs, wrote to the Moorish king to promise him that they would continue to treat Moorish culture and Moors with complete respect. I'll just read you an extract from one of their letters, dated November 1491. Their highnesses and their successors shall forever permit the king and his officials and all the population, great or humble, to live by their own law, and they shall not allow their mosques to be taken from them, nor their towers and muzines. Income reserved for these things shall not be touched, nor shall their existing customs be interfered with. Moors will be judged according to their law and according to their own justices. So, so far so good, although the letter does go on to say, a bit more ominously, quote, Moors wishing to leave for Barbary or other lands shall be given free and safe passage by their highnesses, along with their families, movable goods, merchandise, jewels, gold, silver and all types of arms except for powder weapons. To expedite their passage, their highnesses shall provide ten large ships which for a period of seventy days shall wait in the appropriate ports and then carry them free and safely to the Barbary ports. So that is a little bit of, but if you want to leave, we'll make it easy for you, isn't it? We do know that quite a lot of Muslims did elect to stay on, many more did decide to flee, and that the last Moors were expelled from Spain in 1609. Worse still, this period, from 1492 onwards, was the period of the Inquisition, an edict went out, professing intolerance of Jews, fearing that they would be contaminating the Catholic faith, and we do know that 400,000 Jews fled Spain in this period, including many from Seville. Seville, I'm afraid, was the centre of the Inquisition in the San Jorge Castle, so St. George Castle in Triana. It was set up, and a whole regime of denouncing people who claimed they had renounced their Jewish faith and become Christians Neighbours would say, no, actually, they're still professing their own faith at home. And the terrifying period of imprisonment and torture and execution by burning, which we know from the history books as the Spanish Inquisition, began then. Alongside that, however, this is also the period, from 1492 onwards, known as the Golden Age in Seville, the time when it became the centre of trade with America, the place from which explorers like Christopher Columbus set out to conquer the New World or travel to the Far East. Actually, they didn't always leave exactly from Seville. Often it was from other port cities a bit further south. But Seville was the centre. Queen Isabel saw to that, gave the city the monopoly of trade to and from America, and the city was awash with money for several generations. Gradually, however, other ports like Cadiz took over and Seville went into decline. A key date in the 18th century is 1771, when the Royal Tobacco Factory was built, a new form of wealth generation 
though of course it was linked to the old form, tobacco having been brought by Christopher Columbus. It marked the beginning of an industrial era, which went on through the 19th century. Early on in 1810, the French occupation of the city. The key date would be 1845, when the bridge to Triana was finally built, the one that you see today, the Puente Isabel, the Isabel Bridge, named after the reigning queen. By the late 19th century, Seville was going into decline, the whole of Spain in fact. Loss of colonies in South America was a major factor in that. But the very early 20th century saw an attempt at a fight back, an idea that maybe they could revive the spirit of the Golden Age in a new way. Plans were made for an exhibition to be held in 1929, and early on in the 20 or so years before that, buildings were being put up. The exhibition was going to be Spanish-American in flavour, the hope being that they could revive Spain's role as the link with America in Europe. Two big squares were built, the Plaza de America and the Plaza de España, Art Deco in style, but also very Spanish in style, full of tiles and fountains and flags and pictures commemorating all the different areas of Spain. Unfortunately, it didn't come to the hoped-for conclusion, because in 1929, the planned date for all this to come to a crescendo turned out, of course, to be the year of the world economic crash. I think Seville was in debt for decades after that, paying off all the money which had been borrowed to put up these wonderful buildings. However, they are still there today and you can go and enjoy them. The 1920s and 30s were characterised by dictatorship, starting with General Primo de Rivera and followed on then by General Franco, who became head of state in 1936. Beginning of the Civil War, Seville fell early on to the nationalist regime and by the end of the war in 1939, across Spain generally, 500,000 people were deemed to have lost their lives. The early years after the Civil War are known as the Hungry Years. The economy was absolutely in the doldrums until the early 1950s when economic aid from America was offered in return for US bases on Spanish soil. And following that, an economic boom built up really quite quickly through the 1960s. 1962, for example, saw the beginning of the idea of developing the Costa del Sol for tourism. I think, in financial terms at least, you'd have to say that's been a massive success. Another key date, 1975, with the death of Franco and the end of the dictatorship and the restoration of the monarchy, King Juan Carlos I, who set about organising free elections and then Spain since then has been a democracy. Coming right up to date, recent years have not been the easiest. 2013 saw a record level of unemployment. I think in that year, youth unemployment in Spain hit 50%. But there has been a bit of a recovery since then, and one symbol of that, a symbol of new growth and looking to the future, was built in the city in 2011, and that is the Metropole Parasol, or as the civilians themselves call it, Las Setas, the Mushrooms, a huge futuristic edifice which was built in the rather run-down Macarena district of the city in the hope of regenerating it. Said to be possibly the world's largest wooden building, it's 28 metres high at its highest point. The platform on top is undulating, actually, so it's not all that high. Five giant pillars holding up honeycombed platforms. And there's a walkway all around the top, 250 metres long, which you can wander around and see the city, all 360 degrees of it, from the various viewpoints set up up there. It's used for tourists. It's also a space for concerts and events and the lower levels have got shops and restaurants. It took six years to build, and I think it would be fair to say it divides opinion. But I think it is becoming a new symbol of the city. It can be seen from many places in Seville, and it is fun to climb up to the top and have a look round. And something bringing us right round full circle back to the history where we started, very typical of Seville, when they were excavating to build this metropole, what they found, unexpectedly, were some Roman ruins and rather cleverly they've incorporated those into the finished building. So on the ground floor there's a part which is a museum where you can go in and see what they found in the Museo Antiquarium. So, just to finish then, a few ideas about Seville as a modern city. What are the things that are typical of it? Well, an actual symbol is the weather vane on the top of the Giralda, which is a revolving statue of faith, 
which is known in Spanish as the Giraldillo, which is why the tower is called the Giralda. Another symbol of the city you will see on buildings such as the town hall, you'll see it on buses too, a very strange looking thing. It looks like two words with a big figure eight in the middle, so it sort of reads no, figure eight, do. And you might think, what is that? Well, it's a short written form of the words no me ha dejado, which apparently means she has not deserted me and is said to have been uttered in the 13th century, no less, by King Alfonso. Alfonso the Wise, we'll be meeting him later. When Seville was loyal to him, he was in dispute with his son, who I think was trying to usurp him, and the civilians decided they would stick with Alfonso, and he uttered this phrase, No me ha dejado, she has not deserted me. It's a bit of a convoluted explanation as to why what you actually see represents that phrase, And for all the number of times I've read it, I'm not sure it quite works. But anyway, I'll tell you the theory. So the the figure eight, the double loop, represents a skein of wool. That being because the word in Spanish for skein of wool is madeja. So if you read what's there, no, followed by the word madeja, followed by do, you more or less get to no me ha dejado. Personally, I think there's a syllable missing, but oh well, what do I know? So it's a sort of motto for the city about loyalty. Patron saints, the patron saints of Seville are Santa Justa and Santa Rufina, two Christian women who worked in the potteries of Triana in the 3rd century, i.e. under the Romans, and got into trouble because the Romans wanted them, everyone I think, to take part in a procession which was to venerate the goddess Venus, and they refused because they were Christians and they thought this went against their faith. And for this, they were condemned to death, this is in the year 287, and thrown to the lions. There's another story concerning them from much later, 1755, when it's said that the Giralda was threatened by an earthquake and the two saints intervened to save it. You'll see pictures of them in artwork all over the city. They were painted by the artist Murillo, for example. They were painted by Zorbaran. And they're often shown with the building of the Giralda in the background as a remembrance of the story. It's very much a city of mixed cultures, as I hope I've already shown, Arabic, Christian, Jewish, and others. And the Arabic particularly, I think, has left its mark. So in the language, in the Spanish language generally, but particularly in Seville. So for example, Guadalquivir comes directly from the Arabic words Wadi el Kabir, which meant Great River. The Muslims called the city Isbilia when they settled it. And you can hear, can't you, how Isbilia became Sevilla, or Seville, as we call it. And then, of course, you've got Arabic words all over the Spanish language generally, things like Narancha, to quote one pertinent to Seville, orange, and Azúcar, which means sugar, and Arroz, which means rice. Very Sevillian are the tiles. They, too, have a mixed cultural heritage. It's thought to be the Moorish settlers in Triana who first realised how good the soil there was for clay and developed kilns in which to fire it. And so early tiles are often quite Arabic in style with their geometric patterns and their colour range of blue and green and ochre and black and white. The later ones are more European influenced. You'll see a lot of blue and white tiles influenced on things that came from Holland in the 17th century. And tiles you will certainly see all over the city particularly in Triana, where many of the shop fronts are decorated tile displays, but in many other less expected places too, often on the churches, for example. There are Art Deco-style tiled benches in the Parque Maria Luisa. We mustn't forget that it's a city which very much leans on gypsy culture, out of which grew both flamenco and bullfighting. Seville, for example, has the oldest bullring in Spain, one which is rivalled perhaps by the one in Madrid for grandeur, but I don't think by any others. And it's also from Seville that some of Spain's most famous bullfighters have hailed. Flamenco is said to have originated in Triana, and the gypsy influence on that is described by Jan Morris in her travel book, Spain, when she writes, Wherever a castanet clicks in Spain, a heel taps, a pair of hands claps, or a deep sad voice wails through the night, then the influence of the gypsies is somewhere about. Something very much associated with Seville as well is, of course, oranges. People try and go at the end of April because that's when the orange trees will be in blossom. 
You may know that Byron famously said he thought Seville was famous for two things, they being oranges and women. The original bitter oranges were brought to Seville by the Arabs, probably in the 10th century, hence the reason why they have an Arabic name, Arancha. The sweeter ones are thought to have come more in the 16th century by some of the traders who'd been to China. You'll find orange trees all over the city, but most famously perhaps in the Patio de las Naranchas, the Patio of the Oranges, which was the place outside the mosque where worshippers would stop to purify themselves, washing in water from the fountain before going inside, and which is still today planted with, I think it's 60 orange trees. And I'm sure it's no coincidence that one of Seville's two great festivals is timed exactly to be in full orange blossom season. So, coming on to festivals then, something else that Seville is definitely very well known for. The two key ones are Semana Santa, the week-long, very mysterious, solemn event when hooded penitents from brotherhoods all over the city carry their tableau, which is usually afloat with a crucified Christ on it or a model of grieving Mary, the mother of Christ, through the streets to the cathedral in time for Easter Sunday. It's very much Seville's own festival, The people of the city come out in their thousands to watch in silence, perhaps punctuated by a slow drumbeat, the many processions, some of which take up to 12 hours to complete. But it's also true that it's a period in which many people come from all over the world to see the spectacle as well. Much lighter in tone a few weeks later, exactly in orange blossom season, towards the end of April, the Feria de Abril, which was originally a trade and livestock fair, and which certainly still has its roots in that. You'll see, for example, a lot of horses being ridden up and down in the afternoons, but which in the evenings is taken over in huge marquees for song and dance, often flamenco in flavour, eating and drinking, and which goes on not just all evening, but actually all night. I think staggering home at 6am is not that unusual. All of this, six nights in a row. So yes, definitely the city of fiestas. And apparently her claim to, although I don't know how true it is, to being the city which invented tapas. And it's certainly true that tapas, those tasty morsels which are served with drinks in bars all over the city, especially in the evenings, are very much a feature too. So, so many reasons to visit Seville, so many aspects of history and culture that we need to have a little look at. And the following 12 episodes then will be my aim to do exactly that just run through what they're going to be. Episode 2, we're going to start with the Alcazar and look at Moorish history in the city. Episode 3, move on to the Christians and the Jews through the Cathedral, the Giralda and Santa Cruz. Episode 4 will be for the Golden Age, so the story of the explorers and also the buildings and places in the city where you can go and find out more about that. I'm going to devote episode 5 to the two festivals, Semana Santa and Feria de Abril. Episode 6, continuing the theme of enjoying oneself in Seville. I'm going to devote that to the park and several of the palaces. And then for episode 7, cross the bridge into Triana and look particularly at its links with Columbus and its links with the tile-making industry, which is now such a feature of Seville. That will lead us on nicely to episode 8 on bullfighting and episode 9 on flamenco. In both of those, we'll be talking about the history and visiting some places that are connected with them, so the Bull Ring, the Flamenco Museum, etc. Episode 8, then, will be on the art in Seville, mainly on the Museo de Bellas Artes, so the big main art gallery, but also popping into a couple of other places where there are some fantastic paintings to be seen, and a look at some of the artists connected with Seville, Murillo, Zorbaran, Velasquez. Episode 11, Gastronomia, so we'll look at typical Andalusian ingredients, a little bit on tapas, a quick word about sherry, although that's more other cities than Seville, in fact, and some quotes from travel writers who've been to Seville and very much enjoyed what they've eaten and drunk. And then to finish off, episode 12 on travel writing, so some short quotations and a look at several books by people who wrote at length about the city, including two quite contemporary ones, one of which by a writer, Jason Webster, who went to Spain in general, and including Seville, in search of the Arabic roots in the country. And a second one, again all round Spain, but including Seville, by Edward Lewin, 
who attached himself to a matador and his entourage and spent a year travelling around Spain behind them. So we can get the background to bullfighting from that. And lastly then, episode 13, Stories of Seville. I'd like to finish off by talking about some of the fiction connected to the city. Stories by Cervantes to start with and following up with stories about those two characters that you almost forget are fictional, who are so much embedded in the culture of Seville, namely Don Juan and Carmen. I fear this has been a slightly longer episode than usual, but that's only because there are so many enticing things to say about Seville. And I hope I've left you keen to join me next week to make a start on our virtual tour of the city. For now, though, I'd just like to try out two of the Spanish phrases which I've learned especially for this series. The first one being the way to thank you very much for listening, muchas gracias. And the second one, the way to sign off in Spanish and say goodbye, adios. <laughs>